Allah knows what's best for us, so why should we complain? We always want the sunshine, but He knows there must be rain. We always want the laughter and the merriment of cheer, but our hearts will lose their tenderness. If we never shed a tear, so whenever we feel that everything's going wrong, it is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome. To inspirations after spending a very beautiful time <coughs> during the month of Ramadan talking about the Muslim character about talking about the profound nature of Tawheed and how strong the impact it has on our character now we come back to live with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to spend some time with him to learn from him to learn from his dedication to learn from his Iman and his faith to learn from his love and his affection to the people around him to learn from his mercy and to learn from everything that he displayed uh, in the different uh, circumstances he had to deal with now we talked about how much challenge the Prophet Sallallahu received from his people and the evil response that he had to deal with but he remained patient and he endured patiently all the trials he had to deal with and he displayed how wonderful his character was and that he was a mercy to mankind and even when the people of Quraysh you know offered him you know women and wealth and leadership and everything he made it clear to them that I am a person, not all, not after all of these things. I'm a person who came to you with a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I am conveying the message. All what I want from you is to realize the truth, to save yourselves from the hellfire, and to show you the way that will take you to paradise. So this is what my life is all about. And I will never give up spreading this message and you can plot and you can scheme and do plan for whatever you want to do but i will remain persistent until i fulfill my duty so that was the message the, the message the prophet sallam delivered and made clear to the people of mecca the people of mecca tried other ways to oppose the prophet sallam once they asked him for a miracle they said to him okay show us a miracle now every prophet who comes to his people shows them a miracle it shows that he that he has come from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is supported by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so they challenged the prophet sallam and he said to them they said to him show us a miracle so the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam showed them a miracle that was even discovered, the traces of it and the signs of it and the remains of it were discovered today by scientists. So the Messenger وسلم, supplicated to Allah and Allah caused the moon to split into two pieces, into two halves. The people of Quraysh saw that with their own eyes. Now this is a great miracle. The moon itself, the full moon itself, you know, broke into, was split into two pieces and each piece went to a different direction. The people of Quraysh saw the miracle with their own eyes. You know, it, they should have believed at that time because they asked for a, mir the mir a miracle and the miracle is there. They could, see it, they could see it with their own eyes. They should believe in it. But they didn't believe. They said, Muhammad is a magician and he managed to you know, do some magic for our own eyes. So it's something that affected our own eyes, but the moon was still as it was. But uh, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, or some of them, the people of Quraysh, said, okay, if we have, you know, been affected by the magic of Muhammad, let's ask the people, you know, who are traveling, the caravans who were coming to Mecca, let's, you know, wait for them until they come to Mecca, then we will ask them, it's impossible for them to be affected by the magic of Muhammad. Now when the caravans came days later, 
they said that we saw that the moon split into two pieces. So that was a proof that this it was a miracle from from Allah subhanahu wa taala given to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to show the people of Mecca that they have no reason, no excuse, to disbelieve in Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam being the message. But they did not believe. Some people saw the two halves of the moon, one of them on each one of them on uh, the top of different mountains on different directions. But they did not believe. The caravans came and arrived in Mecca and they said that we saw that the moon split. So the people of Mecca knew that it was not magic. And they knew that Muhammad was a prophet from Allah. But it was their arrogance. It was the disbelief that was deep in their hearts. It was the act of shaitan that convinced them not to believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And they refused that. And I want you to imagine the Prophet وسلم, enduring all this resistance from his people, enduring all those slanders and rumors spread around him that he was a liar, that he was mad, that he was a magician, that he was a sorcerer. Okay, he endured all of that patiently. He remained, pa he remained patient and he was concerned for his people. He wanted them to believe all what he wanted, that they accept the message and they save themselves from the hellfire. This is all what he wanted. You know, he dedicated his life for that. So he was concerned for them and he felt so much pain and sad and sadness. You know, why my people are not accepting the message? He said, you are going to the hellfire. I want to save you. This was, you know, you know this was the attitude of the Prophet ﷺ. But they remained obstinate. They remained stubborn. They did not believe. Although they saw the sign. Clear. They saw the miracle, but they did not believe. And you could feel the disappointment the Messenger وسلم, felt. That he wanted to guide them. He wanted to show them, you know, where their interest lies. He wanted to show them, you know, what is good for them. He was saying to them, I'm concerned for your own welfare. I'm concerned for your own future. But they don't want to believe. And actually they, they accused him more. They slandered him more. So... You could imagine the disappointment the Prophet ﷺ felt at that time. After seeing the clear signs, they have seen the sign. You know, someone would have expected that. After having seen the signs, you know, now they must, you know, they must come believe. They must become believers. But no, they did not become believers. And it shows that the reason for the disbelief was their own, you know, insistence and persistence on disbelief. And their own arrogance. So they deserve. The people who remained disbelievers. And died as, as disbelievers. They deserve to be. And to go to the hellfire. Something that we can learn here. Sometimes you know. Some people say. you know, uh, We have to show Islam to everyone. Which is true. We have to convey the message of Islam. And we hear some weird words here and there. They say. you know, If these people get to know Islam as it really is. They would believe. We say no, they won't believe. The people who will believe are the ones that Allah has, uh, you know, has really opened the eyes to the truth and the hearts to accept the truth. And we have seen many people from the non-believers, from the disbelievers, non-Muslims, and they saw the signs and they saw the beauty of Islam and they recognized that Islam is the religion of the truth, but they did not accept it. And they fought it. They fought against it. They slandered Islam. They lied against Islam. They wrote so many books, so many theses, lying against Islam just to push the way and turn the, pay, uh, the, turn the people away from Islam. So don't think that all people, once they realize the truth about Islam, that they accept it full-heartedly. No. There are many people who will refuse. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَمَا أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ وَلَوْ حَرَصْتَ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ And most people, even if you are so keen to guide them, most people will not be guided because they don't want to be guided. Allah gave them free choice to choose. And Allah gave them the two ways. وَهَدَيْنَاهُ النَّجْدَيْنَ Allah gave us the two ways. The way of goodness and the way of falsehood, the way of disbelief. And it's up to us to choose. Unfortunately, most people give precedence to their desires, the desires of this world. They cannot sacrifice their desires for the sake of eternal happiness and eternal blessings in paradise. Most people are very keen and, uh, to enjoy this world, 
and do away with the enjoyment of the hereafter. This is the mistake most people fall in and commit. And unfortunately, it's only one opportunity, one chance that we are given, which is this life, to choose where we want to go, to paradise or to the hellfire. So the Prophet ﷺ must have felt disappointed when he saw this aversion from the people of Quraysh and their hatred to the truth and their uh, obstinate opposition and refusal and rejection of the truth. It must have affected him and uh, left a scar in his heart. And just another sign to show that the people of Quraysh knew that Muhammad ﷺ was a prophet but there was it was their arrogance, it was their... Uh, haughtiness it was you know their uh, insistence on disbelief that prevented them from accepting the message of Islam that one day uh, al mughira ibn Shu'ba one of the people of Al-Ta'if he was in Mecca with one of his friends Abu Jahl they were walking in the streets of Mecca and all of a sudden they came across the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw them Despite all the opposition and all the ins- you know the uh, insults the Prophet ﷺ received from Abu Jahl and the abuse and the bad treatment, still the Prophet ﷺ, he greeted him and he said to him, Ya Abu Jahl, isn't it time for you to believe and accept the message? You know that I, am, I came as a messenger from Allah, you know that. It's time for you to believe, why don't you believe, Ya Abu Jahl? Abu Jahl said to Muhammad ﷺ, leave us alone. You know, leave us, stop preaching Islam. You know, you just want us to, you know, to bear witness that you have delivered the message. Okay, I bear witness that you have delivered the message. Okay, give up this call. Leave us alone. Don't preach Islam to us anymore. So the Prophet ﷺ left him and he went away. So Abu Jahl said to Al Mughira ibn Shu'ba, he said to him, you know, I know that what Muhammad is telling is the truth. I know that. But you know, the children of Qusay, because there were different clans from Quraysh, the children of Qusay, the fifth grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ, you know, they said that uh, guardianship over the, or maintenance of the haram, of the sacred house, is for us. We said, okay, you get that. They said, al liwa which is the banner or the flag or the leadership of the military affairs is for us. We said, okay. And they said, uh, you know, and Nadwa is for us, uh, sort of, uh, you know, political leadership over Mecca is for us. We said, okay. And they said, hijab, uh, or uh, they said, okay, we will feed, it's our responsibility to feed the pilgrims and to provide them with food and water. We said, all right. But then we provided food with them and we started competing until we caught up with them. And now they're say, saying one of us is a prophet. I will never believe in him. So... Actually, it was this feeling, the false pride in uh, one's family and one's lineage uh, that, w- that prevented Abu Jahl from accepting the truth. This hadith, the scholars are not agreed, or this narration, the scholars are not agreed that it is authentic. They differed about it. Some people considered it to be weak. Some of them considered it to be hasan. So I'm not sure about its authenticity. We mention it as it has you know, no implications on fiqh or aqeedah, and it actually reflects the real state of the people of Mecca, that they really knew that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was telling the truth, and he was a messenger from Allah, but it was their arrogance, and it was their false pride in their own tribes, and their own clans, and their own families, that prevented them from accepting the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa realized that his people knew that he was a prophet, but they did not want to accept the truth. But despite all this opposition, despite all this disappointment, the Messenger وسلم, remained firm and strong. And he kept preaching the message of Islam to everyone. And he remained persistent. And he had high morale in spreading the message of Islam. He never gave, gave up. And this is how we should be today. And when, see, when we see the opposition against Islam today, when we see the war against Islam in the media, uh, military war and everything, it should make us more persistent in spreading the message of Islam to the people and showing them the beauty of Islam and the people who are looking for the truth, inshallah, will accept it. And we shouldn't you know, surrender to disappointment. When we preach Islam to the others, convey the message of Islam to others, and we don't receive a positive response, don't give up. Still, 
convey the message of Islam to more people repeatedly preach Islam to them remind them of the truth hopefully inshallah make dua inshallah one day people will accept the message of Islam this is the spirit that we should learn from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and actually the uh, false propaganda that the people of Quraysh spread about Muhammad that he was mad and he was possessed by jinn and so on and so forth sometimes it brought positive results because there was one man from Arabian Peninsula who came to Mecca his name was Dimad he was a very wise person now this man uh, he was some sort of a doctor he could heal people who had madness or who had who uh, suffered from position jinn position uh, spirit position so he heard about Muhammad that the people spread news about him that he was possessed by jinn so he said I will come to this man I will see this man Muhammad and uh, hopefully that Allah will cure him you know by means of me because I know how to cure from the evil spirit so he came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he sat with him and he said Ya Muhammad I am a person uh, that Allah causes people to be healed by means of me I, I have learned how to you know uh, cure people from this evil spirit I'm from possession so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him sit down he sat down the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him all praise is due to Allah I praise him I seek his help and I ask for his forgiveness Whomever Allah guides, none can lead him astray. And whomever Allah leaves to go astray, none can guide him. And I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah. I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah. I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah. Now Dimad heard these words and he said, you know, I've seen mad people, I've seen people who have been possessed. I've, I know poet, poets. I know, I know mad people, I know about madness, but none of them speaks such noble words. I, these words can only be from Allah, and those words can only be said and conveyed by a prophet. So he extended his hand to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, you must be a prophet. I bear witness that none has the right but Allah, and that you are the messenger of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, I will not shake your hand and give you a covenant until you promise me to spread the message of Islam to your people as well. And Dimad was the leader of his people. So he said, and I will give you my allegiance of myself and my people that I will convey the message to them. And he became Muslim. So we see when we put our trust in Allah and we remain persistent in our da'wah, Allah will help us. So never give up when you see the people trying to defame Islam. The media is waging a war against Islam, distorting Islam, uh, distorting the image of Islam. We still, you know, persistent in our da'wah. We teach the world about the beauty and the purity of Islam. And inshallah, the people who are looking for the truth, Allah will guide them to it. And Allah will make them come to it, inshallah. Uh, now, there were some people coming from Medina. Uh, and those people came because Medina was uh, made of tribes and those tribes always fought against each other. Like Al-Awz wa Khazraj always fought against each other. One party of them, or one side of them came to Mecca. They were seeking the help of Quraysh. The, uh, they wanted Quraysh to become their allies in order to help them against the other tribe. Now among those two people, there was a young man called Iyas ibn Mu'adh and their leader, the leader of that group, of that delegation who came to Mecca was Anas ibn Rafi'. Something very interesting happened to them. Insha'Allah, stay with us after the break to find out the beautiful story that happened with this group of people who coming from Medina to Mecca. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome back. You're still watching Inspirations. And we are still talking about the challenges the Prophet sallallahu endured patiently and wisely. And how he started to make, you know, a difference in the lives of some of the important people, you know, in the Arabian Peninsula. 
Uh, now, we said that there was a group of people who came from Medina. They are from Banu Abd al-Ashhal, the tribe of Banu Abd al-Ashhal. They came to seek the help of Quraysh and their alliance uh, against, you know, the, against their enemies in Medina as well. Actually, they were cousins in the first place, but they were fighting among, uh, you know, against each other. Uh, so they came to seek the help of Quraysh. The Prophet ﷺ heard about them. So he went to see them and he sat with them. He said to them, you know, would you like to hear something or let me offer you something better than the thing that you came for? You, get, you came to try and get, you know, Quraysh to be your allies against your cousins. You know, I have something better than that to offer you. What do you think? They said, okay, we'll hear. We don't have a problem with that. So the Messenger وسلم, said to them, I am a messenger from Allah. I'm calling you to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and to abandon the worship of the idols and to, uh, to establish the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone to single out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with all forms of worship and to support me to convey this message to the people because Quraysh have prevented me from that. So uh, this young man, Iyas ibn Mu'ad, he turned to his people and he said to them, by Allah, this is something, you know, far greater than the thing that we came for. This is a great thing. This is a great author. But their leader at that time, Anas ibn Rafi' looked at him and he held some sand in his hand and he threw it in the face of Iyas ibn Mu'ad and he said to him, just shut up, okay? Come off it. We didn't come for this. We came for something more important. So... Iyas ibn Mu'ad remained silent and the Prophet ﷺ saw that this was the case so he left them and went. He conveyed the message to them and he did part, his part of the job. Now this young man, Iyas ibn Mu'ad, he saw that the Prophet ﷺ was telling the truth and he was a messenger. So it seems that he believed in him. So they went back to, uh, to Medina and there was a war. The war took place in Medina and after some time, this Iyas ibn Mu'ad, this young man, uh, for some reason died. He was dying. And as he was dying, he, uh, you know, some of the people of Medina narrate the story. They say when he was dying, he kept saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah. He had faith. Since that time, he met the Prophet Wasallam. years later. He still, throughout that time, he knew that Muhammad was a prophet from Allah. So he straight away believed in the message of Islam because the Prophet ﷺ, when he conveyed the message to them, he told them what Islam is all about and what how they should what they should do, single out Allah in worship, and he recited some of the Quran to them. So he took a brief of the message of Islam, a condensed or a crash course on Islam, so he understood the essence of it and he believed in it. But he could not, you know, uh, break or challenge the leadership of that man, Anas ibn Rafi. So when the moment of tie of death when the moment of death came to him, there was no fear of the leadership. And Iman came up to the surface and he uh, revealed his Iman to the people around him. So the people of Medina said, we had no doubt that he died as a Muslim. So the Prophet ﷺ was still spreading the news about Islam and still some good fruits were coming. And sometimes maybe you give some people da'wah and you don't realize, you know, you don't realize that some people get affected. Maybe some, some years later, you know, the seed that you planted in the hearts of those people starts to grow. You know, one day I remember uh, I was in London, one of the masajid there, one of the mosques, and I met an English person, mashallah, an English Muslim brother. And uh, we were sitting and he pointed at an elderly person, an Iraqi person who's been living in the UK for more than uh, 45 years. He spent most of his time there. And this, you know, this elderly Iraqi man, mashallah, May Allah grant him a lot of mercy. He's a very wise man, a very nice man. Uh, his name was Abu Yasin. He's very well known. He's always there in Hyde Park. And he always invites the younger brothers to give da'wah. This Abu Yasin, uh, mashallah, a very nice man. And may Allah reward him. And he always encourages the brothers to give da'wah in Hyde Park, in Leicester Square, in different parts of the UK. Uh, so one, day he wa in one night he was in Leicester Square, this old man. And he had the da'wah table, he had pamphlets to give out to people talking about Islam. So this young Englishman, he, he, at that time, you know, he, he wasn't a believer. He was just 
an atheist or something, any like any average, you know, English uh, gentleman. And he was spending his nights during the weekend in nightclubs, drinking, partying with women, all that stuff. Just the normal stuff uh, for any average Englishman, young man. So, and he happened to pass by the da'wah table, and Abu Yasin, this old, uh, old man, gave him da'wah. He spoke to him briefly about Islam, and he gave him some pamphlets. So, at that time, he was not affected. But he took the pamphlets, he read them, and he kept them. So, about five years later, he said, the words of that old man, you know, started to grow in my heart like a seed. In my heart like a seed. I started to think about them. I became more cu cu curious about Islam. I read the pamphlets. I became convinced about Islam. I asked, inquired more about Islam, and I became Muslim. So, he said to me, now I recognize this old man. He was in the same masjid. He gave me da'wah about five years ago. And I'm sure that he doesn't remember me. He doesn't remember me. He doesn't know me. So he just threw that word and he gave da'wah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused that person to believe in Islam, to accept Islam five years later. So let's always, you know, preach the message of Islam. Give it to the people. You don't know when the seed will grow. Just like the story that happened to Abu Yasin, this elderly, and to this English brother who embraced Islam. May Allah, you know, make us all firm on Islam and strengthen us in Iman. So this was the practice of the Prophet Sallallahu He always gave da'wah and he knew that it will never go in vain. Uh, now, the people of Quraysh wanted to make it even difficult. They wanted to have excuses and display excuses why they, did, they, they didn't, want, didn't want to believe. They just want, they just tried to justify it for themselves and for the others. So they said one day to the Prophet Sallallahu you know, those poor people like uh, uh, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, Abdullah bin Mas'ud and other poor people and slaves, you know, uh, if you want us to listen to you and hear what you say, O Muhammad, and consider what you say, you know, push, you know, get rid of them. Because we don't want them to feel that they are equal to us. Okay, because we want to talk to you, O Muhammad, we want to listen to you. And you keep their company, the company of those low people. Okay, just get rid of them so it will be more comfortable for us to speak to you and listen to you. So actually they were playing games. And the Prophet ﷺ felt bad about that because those are believers. And this is why Allah revealed the verses in Surah Al-An'am. وَلَا تَطْرُدِ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيِّ يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَهُ مَا عَلَيْكَ مِنْ حِسَابِهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ وَمَا مِنْ حِسَابِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَتَطْرُدَهُمْ فَتَكُونَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ Allah said to the Prophet ﷺ, and do not, you know, uh, push away or turn away for, uh, from those people who call on Allah, who remember Allah day and night, seeking the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, you know, their account is not on you, their reckoning is not on you. And your reckoning is not on, on them. It means that they are responsible for the actions and you are responsible for your own actions. Uh, if you expel them, if you push them away, then you will be doing something wrong and you will be oppressing them. Then Allah says, وَكَذَلِكَ فَتَنَّا بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضٍ لِيَقُولُوا أَهَاؤُلَاءِ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ بَيْنِنَا أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِأَعْلَمَ بِالشَّاكِرِينَ Allah says that we have made some of them a trial to the others. Like we have made those poor people a trial for the disbelievers who were so arrogant and they said we don't want to be, become like those people, those weak people, those low people who have embraced Islam. So they said to the Prophet ﷺ, leave them and keep away from them so we can give you the opportunity to speak and then we will listen to you if you get rid of those people. So Allah says, we made some of you a trial to the others. So that they say, are those the ones that Allah favored? Those low people, are they the ones Allah favored? How can Allah favor some you know, low people like those? If Allah was to f favor somebody, He would favor us. We are the best among our people. So Allah says, we made this a trial for them. Then Allah says at the end of the verse, Isn't Allah most knowing of who are really thankful? Yes, Allah knows who are thankful. So the people of Quraysh were always, try, always trying to justify why they turn away from the message uh, of the, from the message of Muhammad وسلم, why they don't want to listen to him. You know, they started to find excuses here and there, and all those excuses are wrong and false. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed them in those verses. They even put you know, more challenges in the way of the Prophet ﷺ. For example, they said to the Prophet one day, okay, if you want us to believe in you, we have one condition. We will believe if you fulfill it. The Messenger ﷺ, you know, became very keen to know what was, what's that condition? Because he wanted them to be guided. They wanted, he wanted them to accept the message. So they said to him, uh, yes, he, uh, they said, uh, he said to them, what's your condition? They said, we will believe in you if you call on Allah to make the mount of As-Safa, mountain, this mountain, turn it into gold. If it turns into gold, then we will believe. That's our condition. You know, it's, now it's a very clear-cut situation. Either you believe or don't disbelieve. They said to him, ask Allah to turn this mount of As-Safa into gold and we will believe in you. There's no doubt. So now it's a clear thing. If it turns gold, then you have to believe. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows them. Allah knows that they are not really asking for a sign to believe, but they are just trying to make it hard for the Prophet sallallahu And they're playing games in brief. That's it. They're playing games. So the Prophet sallallahu supplicated to Allah. Oh Allah, make turn a safa into gold so that they, those people believe. The, the Messenger you know, wanted badly, he wanted those people to believe for any price. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi Jibreel said, Allah conveys the salam to you, Ya Muhammad. And he says to you, if you want Allah, Allah will turn mount a safa into gold. But anyone who disbelieves, Allah will punishment Allah will give them a punishment he never gave to any you know, people before that. Now the Messenger وسلم, tried his people because they asked him for a miracle and they saw the moon split. Still they disbelieved. The Messenger وسلم, knows that most of them will not believe even if Mount Safa turns into gold. So the Jibreel said to him, Allah says to you, you know, if you want, we can turn a Safa into Gold, it will become all gold. But if anyone disbelieves, all those who disbelieve, Allah will give them a punishment. He never gave any punishment before that like it. Anything like it before, it was, you know, it will surpass all the previous punishments. And if you wish, we cannot, you know, we can just keep a suffer as it is and not answer their demand and still open for them the door for repentance and mercy and forgiveness. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh Allah, keep the door for them open for repentance and forgiveness and mercy. The Messenger ﷺ knew his people very well. He knew that even if Mount Safa turns into gold, they will not accept, at least most of them. So because he was a mercy given as a gift to mankind, he said, Oh Allah, uh, uh, I don't want a suffer to become gold, but keep the door open for those people to repent and to uh, receive your mercy and your forgiveness. So the Messenger وسلم, was keen. For his, he just wanted his people to be guided. And knew, he knew that with time, more people will embrace Islam. So he did not want to bring it to a dead end, either believe or be destroyed. That's it. No, he said, still there is hope. So I will maintain this hope. I will keep this hope. And I know, inshallah, that you know, as much as possible among them will come and will embrace Islam. And this was exactly what happened. So many people later on embraced Islam from among the people of Mecca. So we see that the Messenger ﷺ was really merciful to his people. Despite everything they did to him, they tried to kill him many times. But he wanted them to be guided. And this is how we should be today. We should have the same kind of feeling towards the rest of humanity. We have to be keen that they be guided. We have to have this attitude so that we be honest in delivering the message of Al Islam. So the Prophet, Prophet ﷺ, despite all those challenges, all those trials, all those games that the disbelievers were playing, but he never gave up. He kept calling the people to Islam every day, reminding the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he would go to the pilgrims during the season of pilgrimage. He would go to them and display the message of Islam to them and say to them, who will support me to convey the message of Allah? Because my people have prevented me. Who will help me? Who will support me? And for them will be paradise. Who will believe in Allah? Who will worship Allah alone? The message of Islam never gave up. And this is how persistent we should be today. You know, we have become very sensitive today that when we receive any opposition, you know, you know we become 
we think more, you know, we start to have, we start to feel some kind of desperation and that we will not be able to, we will not succeed in our da'wah. No. Our spirit should be just like that of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now when the people of Quraysh saw the persistence of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they decided to resort to a different style. What was the style? It was a bit more aggressive. We will find out inshallah after this short break. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. You are still watching Inspirations. And we are talking about the life of Muhammad sallallahu when he was conveying the message of Islam to his people, to the people of Quraysh. And they tried to put so many obstacles on his way. They tried to make it difficult for him by asking for miracles. But the Prophet sallallahu remained persistent. And this persistence agitated the people of Quraysh and made them feel really bad. And it actually opened their eyes to the fact that they needed to resort to a different style of opposition. So this time, they decided to do away with the whole issue and assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. Just kill him, murder him, and get rid of him. That was the conclusion they came up with. Now, how could they do so? One day they were sitting in close to Al-Kaaba, and they said, you know, there is no person who came to his people, to his tribe, with such an evil trial, with such a problematic thing, just as Muhammad came to his people with. Muhammad came to his people with such a great distress and disgrace. So there is no one who came among the Arabs who came to his people with such a heresy, with such an evil thing. And we have been so much patient with him. So enough of that. So they decided to kill him. And they said, if we see him, then we will kill him. Now Fatima, she was a little daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, just a little girl. She heard about that and she ran to the Prophet ﷺ weeping and crying and she told her father, she told the Prophet ﷺ that the people of Quraysh are conspiring to kill you. They, they are determined to kill you now. The Messenger ﷺ cal calmed her down and he said, don't worry. He made wudu and he went outside and he went to the Kaaba and he found those people gathering and he came to them and he said, he stood next to them. None of them opened None of them uttered a word to Muhammad Sallallahu They were taken by fear. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he came to them and he said to them, Shahat al He said to them, may your faces be disgraced. May you be disgraced. Just as a challenge that you want to murder the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, here he is in front of your eyes. They couldn't do anything. But the news about the conspiracy to assassinate Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam spread in Mecca. So now Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the rest of you know his relatives decided to protect Muhammad. They said, now the people of Quraysh have moved on to a new step. They were they planning to kill Muhammad. No, we will not give them a chance. It's our uh, it's our honor. It's our dignity as a clan from Quraysh to protect our individuals, to protect, to protect Muhammad, he's one of us. Even though we're non-Muslims, but we will protect him, he's our son. They cannot kill him. So they decided to protect him. They knew they will not be able to protect him, except when they, go to, when they keep themselves in a close area, which was, uh, you know, at a small valley. It was called Shabu Abi Talib. So the Muslims, you know, are the family of the Prophet وسلم, his relatives, you know, gathered there to protect Muhammad وسلم, so it was a close, a small area, narrow area, so they could protect him, it wasn't an open area, so it was easier to protect Muhammad وسلم, and the believers joined them, and even the disbelievers from among, you know, the family of, or the household of Abu Talib and Abdul Muttalib remained there with them so that they protect the Prophet وسلم, because it was a matter of dignity and honor to them. Now, that was called, uh, so the people of Mecca became very angry with that, and they decided to boycott everyone who decided to protect Muhammad wasallam, the Muslims and the non-Muslims. They said, you have to hand him over to us to kill him. If you don't do that, we will boycott you. 
or the family of Abdul Muttalib. We will boycott you totally. And so they did. No trading with them. They could not buy, they could not sell anything. They even pre prevented uh, traders from outside to do any trade, any business with them, any business and dealings with them. So they could not even buy food. They could, and they said no marital relations with them. No one marries from them. No one gives them their daughters or sisters in marriage. Total boycott, social, don't sp even speak to them. Total, some kind of sanctions against them. So, uh, it became very hard now because those people, you know, they run out of food, they run out of drink, of drink. they didn't, you know, they couldn't, they didn't know how to survive. There was no means to survive. To the extent that some of them say, uh, some of them said that we had to eat, the, we used for a long time to eat the leaves, the tree leaves in order to survive. We didn't find anything. And even some of the narrations, maybe there, are, there is weakness in it. It says that one of the Muslims said that I was urinating one day and I heard some cracking noise. So I checked what was that, what that was. It was, uh, you know, a piece of skin of a dead animal. It was dry and hard. She said, I took it and I uh, uh, put it in water until it, you know, started to become a bit softer. Then I boiled it and cooked it and then I ate it. Ate it. Because for sometimes for 10 and 15 days they didn't have you know, a bite, no food. They couldn't. Because total boycott, boycott. no one could you know, trade with them at all. But some of, most of the narrations mentioned that this kind of siege or boycott remained for three years. But actually there is no authentic narration that indicates how long that boycott or that hisab took. How, how long it remained for. So we don't, we don't have anything definitive about it. So we can't be sure that it was three years. Because three years is, uh, years is, quite, is quite a long time. So there is no authentic narration that indicates how long it was. So we can't specify. But some of the people of Quraysh actually, they, heart, their hearts really felt the suffering of those people. They said, they're, they're, those are our cousins, our relatives. How can we do this to them? But they did not have the courage or the guts to defy the authority of Abu Jahl and the rest of the people, uh, the rest of the leaders of Quraysh. So what they used to do, they used to you know, put on the back of a camel or a donkey food and drink and everything. They would you know, uh, put lots of food and then they would push it to go by itself to the Shi'b, to the area where Abdul, where Abu Talib and the people who decided to protect Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were. So from time to time they could get some food and some drink here and there. Until they remained there for some time, then the people, some of the good people in Quraysh, they, they actually, they plotted and they conspired to break this boycott. So uh, they agreed one night to speak and support each other and to to breach uh, to announce that they will break it. And we are why are we persecuting our people just because they don't want they don't want to give up Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? And so they did. Uh, they gathered the people of Mecca and they said, you know, it's a shame on us to let our relatives, our cousins, die while we are enjoying food and enjoying our lives. So Abu Jahl said, no, you are a liar. Somebody else said, you are a liar, Abu Jahl. We shouldn't do this to our relatives. A third person, a fourth person. Then they decided to break this boycott. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought relief to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to the family of Abu Talib and to the Muslims who were with them. So many stories, you know, really talk about the suffering of the Muslims and the others when they remained in, uh, you know, during that boycott. But most of them are not authentic. As I said, there's no much harm to mention some of them, but I don't want to focus on that. You know, it was very difficult, very, you know, uh, difficult time for everyone. But Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought relief of it. Now, after the, this boycott, soon after it, remained very major events in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that changed his life forever. They, were, they had profound impact on him. Now join us next time, next week insha'Allah, to talk about those important events and how, you know, deep their impact was on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they, you know, reflect much of the personal uh, feelings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at that time uh, and much of his suffering. So join us next week insha'Allah to talk about that. Until we meet then, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah knows what's best for us, so why should we complain?
We always want the sunshine, but he knows there must be rain. We always want the laughter and the merriment of cheer, but our hearts will lose their tenderness. If we never shed a tear, so whenever we feel that everything's going wrong, it is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong and the merriment of cheer. But our hearts will lose their tenderness if we never shed a tear. So whenever we feel that everything's going wrong, it is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong.